public meeting uh, back since I think March 17th of last year. So uh, 16 months. Uh, so great to see everybody. It's good to see uh, everybody at the dais. Great to see members of the audience and, and uh, other officials. Uh, we are here for a uh, study session, a draft ho housing action plan. And uh, first we'll have a, a staff report by uh, Cheney Skadson, our associate planner. Then uh, we're gonna hear from Sally McLean and Ashley Murphy with the Federal Way School District. Um, uh, Sally is the Chief Finance and Operations Officer, and then Ashley was go will give a presentation as well. Then we'll have op uh, an opportunity for council questions and discussions. This item uh, will be on an action item that will take place during the regular city council meeting. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Cheney. Hi. Hi, good evening. Uh, good evening, Mayor Farrell, uh, Councilman, or Council President Honda, and uh, the rest of the council members. I'm Cheney Skatson, Associate Planner in the Planning Division and the uh, City's uh, Housing Action Plan Project Manager. Also, I would like to just take a moment and introduce our, um, our consultant, uh, Kevin Ramsey. Uh, he's attending on Zoom. I can let him speak. Hello. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can, Kevin. Welcome. Thank you. Oh, I don't know how to make him on the whole screen. Hmm. He's just going to say like, a couple more minutes or a couple more things. Uh, Go ahead, Kevin. Oh, sure. I'll, I'll briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Kevin Ramsey. I'm an associate principal at Burke Recording Consulting. in progress. Uh, and I lead Burke's uh, housing practice. Burke is a public policy consulting firm based in Seattle. Um, over the past few years, I've led or advised housing action plans and strategies for several other communities across Washington, uh, including Tacoma, Seattle, Edmonds, Ellensburg, Yakima, King County, Paris County, and several others. Um, I was also the lead author of the Housing Action Plan Guidance Report published by the Washington State Department of Commerce. Um, and this was the guidebook used by all jurisdictions with commerce funding to create their housing action plans. Um, which is the same program that right away got their funding from uh, to create their housing action plan. So my role in this project um, was the, the consultant project manager. So I, I led the consultant team's effort to support Janie and Brian in the development of this plan. Thanks, Kevin. All right, back to the PowerPoint. Great. So um, tonight we'll be discussing the draft housing action plan that is um, uh, proposed for adoption. Uh, the housing action plan is a thorough study of federal ways housing needs, our, uh, a review of our code, regulations, best practices, and this housing action plan document is a pol is, uh, lays out policy direction to facilitate conditions that encourage housing development, a variety of housing types, at a, on a, along a spectrum of, co of costs or um, prices. What the housing, pra housing Action Plan is not, it's not going to immediately change codes or policies um, or administrative processes. Each of the uh, implementation strategies or actions later in the, uh, I'll go over later, will be um, implemented uh, through a proper planning protocol that will require um, needed more uh, community outreach and uh, additional public participation and uh, work from staff. So this, this HAP is uh, leading, uh, uh, acts as a leading document uh, that will require more work in the future to, to uh, define the details as we get to implementation. I just wanted to start out by, by mentioning that and um, as we discuss, Uh, the policy question. So does City Council recommend adoption of the draft housing action plan? 
Uh, there's, uh, well, the City of Federal Way received a, that $100,000 grant from the Department of Commerce uh, to complete this housing action plan. There is no financial obligation to the city at this time in presenting this information. So that this here is a roadmap to how Federal Way uh, developed the housing action plan. Uh, the uh, City of Federal Way worked with a uh, subgroup of uh, neighboring cities uh, in, this, in the South King County region and developed the uh, South King County housing sub-regional framework. Through this process, we were able to identify broad demographic housing and uh, income trends in the sub-region and, and also address or consider the sub-regional impact of uh, growing community. So in the next, uh, by 2040, the sub-region of these neighboring cities uh, are, is expected to grow by 63,000 uh, people. And, uh, while the rate of development in the subregion has only been 7.5 units for every 10 households. That's going to be really relevant when I get to the next square talking about Federal Ways Housing Needs Assessment. But one final key point uh, finding from our subregional framework is that uh, in the last 10 years, the subregion has seen a decrease in households between 0 and 50 percent AMI. So AMI is the area median income. So this is uh, lower income households or individuals and has seen an increase in 50 to 80 percent AMI households. Uh, this is to, to show not that incomes are rising because it, they are not at the rate of housing costs, but instead that displacement is occurring and it's a, a, also happening in federal way. So that's a great trans transition to some of the findings from Federal Ways Housing Needs Assessment. Uh, between 2010 and 2020, housing costs increased two times faster, and that's rental and home ownership opportunities, than incomes. Um, while only while 40 percent of uh, households in Federal Way are experiencing cost burdening, that's when more than 30 percent of their income goes towards housing. That's 13,000, about 13,000 households. Um, Circling back to our, our rate of development, while the subregion had 7.5 units per 10 households, Federal Way has only experienced a development rate of 5.3 households per, or sorry, 5.3 units per 10 uh, households. So Federal Way is growing slower than our than any of the subregional cities we studied, and more so than the, the uh, entire subregion combined. Um, another key finding from our housing needs assessment is that the current housing stock doesn't. Uh, compat like doesn't fit compatibly with uh, the existing community profile in terms of household types, diversity of housing, such as uh, attached dwelling units, townhouses, uh, AD or not ADUs, well, also including ADUs, but also more so um, uh, um, uh, townhouses, attached dwelling units, like duplexes, and uh, a variety of other uh, housing needs. Um, the next key point to our housing needs assessment or our, our housing action plan was to engage with the public. This was a, an ongoing project or component to the housing action plan that had uh, major uh, opportunities for engagement. Um, this kind of helped uh, balance the quantitative data we got from the sub-regional framework and the housing needs assessment uh, with qualitative data hearing from the community um, and industry specific stakeholders. Uh, there's a variety of techniques used to communicate with the public and get out, uh, input. Uh, I'm happy to go over more of those details if you'd like. Um, another component or the next stage of developing the housing action plan was to review our code and our policies and permitting review to see if there are barriers or ways that can be improved to be more efficient. Um, this, the result of this component to the housing action plan was kind of created a toolbox for planners to use as we go, go um, uh, along amending uh, plans or, or, you know, they helped inform, inform the development of the housing action plan objectives and the strategies and will be relied on as we, we get to that point. Um, the development of the housing objectives relied a lot on um, the common themes we heard from the community. That being, that being uh, pride of diversity in the city, uh, home ownership being uh, something that's very desired, different housing types that are hard to come by in federal way, like townhouses, um, and other missing middle typology. Um, and uh, the final theme that was uh, very apparent was the desire for walkability. Uh, these housing objectives uh, helped inform our housing strategies and actions. Uh, a lot of collaboration went into this part of developing the housing action plan, not only within uh, the work with our consultants in the community, but also with um, the other departments in the city. 
So there was a very iterative process to, to make sure that the strategies kind of had good filter in, in what, um, what other uh, departments uh, are, are um, involved in. And once those strategies were kind of um, defined and prepared, we, we took them public and did, offered two public open houses to educate about the, um, the proposed strategies and answer questions. Um, the final component to the Housing Action Plan was to create an implementation matrix and a priority schedule. Uh, this is the framework for uh, priority. It, it identifies short-term, medium-term, and long-term uh, of what strategies are, are most important to having the biggest uh, input. But it's also, um, um, it's also limited by the availability of resources. Uh, the implementation matrix and priority schedule includes monitoring metrics and milestones to be able to evaluate our progress on achieving not only our housing objectives, but also our housing, each of the housing strategies and actions. And now, after all of that work, we have a draft housing action plan. So these are the four uh, housing op uh, objectives. Number one is to promote new housing development that expands housing choices and is inclusive to community needs. Our second objective is to encourage home ownership opportunities and support equitable housing outcomes. Uh, number three is to plan for continued growth and ensure that the built environment promotes community development and increases the quality of life for Federal Way's existing and future uh, residents. And finally, the, to preserve the existing affordable housing stock to reduce displacement pressure. You know, these, uh, and I'll go over these eight housing uh, strategies, but it's important to note that um, one strategy alone won't work in isolation. A lot of these strategies um, have a kind of a, a combined impact when, when applied or uh, implemented at the same time or a, in a particular er order, it's particularly when uh, the market isn't producing what the housing needs that we, uh, housing types that we need. It's generally a combination of factors. So each strategy and action address some part or more than one part of uh, the barriers or problems to uh, a better way of getting the housing um, that is I, I needed identified in the housing needs assessment. So uh, enough to say that here are these eight housing strategies that we think will help address these needs. Number one is to promote a dense walkable mixed use city center. Uh, this is relying uh, heavily on our best practices of transit-oriented development with the arrival of the link rail station. Uh, number two is to promote mixed-use walkable neighborhood centers. This is simil similar to uh, strategy one, but on a smaller scale and when appropriate in amenity-rich areas. Number three is to expand our missing middle development opportunities. Currently, missing middle, and I'm sorry if I didn't define this earlier, it refers to uh, housing typology that is not single family large lot development and not lar or high density apartments. There's a, a variety of housing types that are uh, missing and particularly from Federal Way's housing stock. Uh, and that's uh, duplexes, triplexes, courtyard apartments, townhouses. Uh, number four is to inc uh, encourage ADU production. ADUs have a variety of uh, benefits they can provide to the community and uh, currently as our code is written is uh, not as um, permissive as we'd like to see. And then number five is to encourage that the incentives for mixed income housing are effective. Currently the city has a variety of mechanisms to in ensure that uh, affordable housing is developed, but we'd like to um, be sure that those uh, tools we have are effective in the outcome we want and not preventative. Uh, number six is to review, uh, review school impact fees on multifamily <coughs> housing. Uh, school impact fees are uh, in the past have either benefited the school district or the city or pro development and uh, this strategy is to find a balance that will work for both that will not be cost prohibitive to development. Number seven is to coordinate uh, to support affordable housing development and preservation. Uh, the city alone won't be able to solve all of the housing need, so working with uh, service providers and other organizations that have an interest in, in seeing our housing needs met is uh, an important component to achieving our housing objectives. And finally, uh, tenant protections and pathways to home ownership. This is a, a objective to ensure that our, our naturally occurring affordable housing remains affordable and safe and also to promote pathways to home ownership that uh, I mentioned were um, desired by the community. So these eight strategies uh, can support uh, one of three or more than one of these, um, these 
categories. So we have um, market rate housing, income restricted housing, and the preservation of existing housing. As you can see, seven of the strategies in the Housing Action Plan support the development of market rate housing. Six strategies support the development of income restricted or affordable housing or low income. And uh, two are supportive of the preservation of existing housing. The, uh, the largest um, makeup of the housing that's affordable to incomes between uh, or below 50% AMI is the naturally occurring affordable housing. It's not the regulated. So it's uh, an effort to preserve, excuse me, preserve that existing housing. So here is just a quick little snapshot of what you could see um, in the near term, like here in the short term of the, the, the uh, strategies and the um, implementing actions. Um, so, number one is working on our downtown or the city center um, to evaluate, evaluate the development environment and to support the uh, public-private partnerships. Number two is um, continued or walkable neighborhoods, and that's to uh, continue to support our transportation demand management program when appropriate, um, coordinate with and support economic development uh, and um, interests of community-based organizations in these neighborhood centers to, for the community to thrive, and then additional long-range planning around, uh, including sub-area planning when necessary and appropriate. Um, number four is uh, we would like to update our, in the near term, our a, um, accessory dwelling unit regulations and fees and uh, annually review and adjust if needed the uh, school impact fees. Um, preservation, that's coordinating with uh, the Department of, or sorry, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Manager or th that uh, position, our, um, an organization, uh, South King Housing and Homelessness Partners Capital Fund, that's something that the city already contributes to, so continued coordination with that. And then um, number eight is the rental inspection program, rental housing inspection program. So each of these, like I mentioned before, each of these strategies and, and subsequent actions will, will have milestones to be able to evaluate the progress and kind of know if we're achieving what we set out to do. Uh, periodic updates and review and uh, adjustments are, are likely to be needed. But uh, these are the metrics for evaluating our progress on achieving the objectives. Number one is uh, the promoting new development. Uh, and we can study this or evaluate this by the rate of development, the type of units being produced, and the affordability level of those new units being produced. Um, encouraging home ownership, we can look at the numbers of uh, homeowners and how they change in federal way and, but, and uh, evaluate the gap between white and BIPOC households. And BIPOC stands for Black Indigenous People of Color. Uh, number three is planning for continued growth and uh, that the quality of life um, is, uh, increases for both existing and future residents. We can look at uh, increased community amenities. We can evaluate through a uh, walk score and the density of new developments in terms of uh, studying walkability. And I don't know why this is so big. Uh, number four, the preservation of affordable housing stock. Um, and to limit, to limit displacement pressures, we can look at the units that are uh, income qualified and, um, and, and how those, that, that amount of units change over time. So I'm gonna do a quick recap. We covered this um, at the last LUTC meeting, but um, one um, mentioned concern or topic was the involvement with the development community. And uh, that's something that the Housing Action Plan emphasizes, and it, it is important, such as uh, Strategy 1 and Action 1 being the public partnerships, um, encouraging the development of public and private partnerships with developers to achieve the desired outcome. Um, and then addressing the uh, concerns around homeowners association and the productions of, uh, of or encouraging accessory dwelling units. Sorry, that's ADUs. So um, the city proposes that when the ADU code is updated, we'll also update our submittal checklist. That will require that if a home belongs within an ADU, or uh, if a house or property belongs within a homeowners association uh, group or boundary, that the um, uh, the applicant supply proof that uh, the HOA has been notified of the um, application, so that there that can be that can avoid any type of concerns or um, conflict with the uh, HOA's bylaws. And it's important to mention that the city can't legally enforce private covenants, and uh, the city can't rent or supersede 
private covenants. So these, um, I think I just need to say that. Um, I'm going to switch over to the next two slides to discuss the next two items that we that came up from the June 7th IUTC meeting. But here is uh, this unit um, or housing forecast map of considering our current zoning, our rate of development, where there's capacity in the city. Um, we uh, made a high level estimate of where we expect these 68 new housing units to be located within the city by 2040. So um, I'm sorry I didn't mention this earlier, but part of the key finding for the housing needs assessment to address uh, future need and existing need, uh, the city will need to accommodate 6,800, nearly 6,800 new housing units by 2040. And this map is a depiction of, of where we think those might locate. And finally, um, a, a additional action was added to the housing action plan to address a concern around um, accessibility and inclusion. So uh, in the strategy one, which is to promote a dense, walkable, mixed-use city center, we included developing a wayfinding plan that is inc uh, inclusive and accessible for people with disabilities. This is uh, a medium-term effort, uh, or yeah, medium-term priority, um, medium level of effort, it would require um, different departments and, or the planning and, and possibly a consultant uh, to work on this and then we could uh, evaluate it by do we have a wayfinding plan. So um, the city council has four options here uh, with the proposed draft housing action plan. One is to adopt the, housing, the draft housing action plan. Number two is to adopt the draft housing action plan with amendments. Number three is to remand the draft housing action plan to LUTC for further discussion. And four, do not adopt, or do not adopt the uh, draft housing action plan. Are there any questions or comments? Council at this stage? Uh, Council President Honda, then Council Member Kochmar. Uh, thank you for your presentation again. What do developers think is an acceptable amount of in school impact fees? Have they ever said? No, that was not a finding as part of the housing action plan of uh, a, a set amount, no. So I know ours have been quite high. Have the, the cities around us with lower impact fees for schools, have they built multifamily housing since 2017 compared to us? Yes, yes, they have. Um, and and I, I will uh, defer to uh, the school district in their presentation later on how those units or how that's calculated. But um, I can say I used to live in Kent, and there's been plenty of multifamily development through the uh, through the creating the uh, housing action plan and, and the advisory group members, uh, school impact fees were a, a common concern or a, a barrier or a cost prohibitive barrier on multifamily development. Okay. Um, the affordable housing stock that you talk about, how would the city identify what is affordable housing and how would they monitor this? And if one of the units was put up for sale, what would the city do to encourage a unit not to be sold? Would there be uh, something, an incentive for the owner not to sell the unit? Or what would the city do? What, what would the proposal be? So I'll start with your first question, that being uh, our, how are we uh, like monitoring our affordable housing units? So part of the sub-regional framework, uh, Eco Northwest created a inventory of the regulated affordable housing units in the city and around the region. And uh, I believe that was maybe it's in the housing action plan. I'd be happy to, to get the number for you. And, um, but the, it was a number much smaller than what is needed in terms of affordable. So the definition of affordable housing is when someone is not spending more than 30% of their housing on income. So it kind of is a threshold that fluctuates depending on the income. Um, so in terms of, uh, you know, we, we know our housing or we know our community profile and we know how many households have certain incomes. So with that data, and we can say we need a certain amount of housing affordable to this income level. And that, that's how we would be able to study or monitor it because those, those uh, what can someone afford depends on their income. Um, and then your last question, uh, please remind me. 
So if um, an affordable unit were to oh, be yeah. sold, would we give an incentive to not sell it? So um, that is not necessarily proposed in the Housing Action Plan right now, but there is a different proposal or a different um, kind of avenue or mechanism that's uh, is suggested in the Housing Action Plan, and that being a, a required uh, notice of intent to sell for uh, units, or mo mostly I think multifamily uh, units that are for sale uh, or that would like to sell and their rents are at a certain income level. Or, or a certain rate that's affordable to certain income levels. So that th these numbers change every year. Right. Um, so it's, it's hard to say, but um, that is a proposal in our, in our medium term, is to uh, adopt an ordinance or propose to adopt an ordinance that when a, you know, a, maybe an old apartment complex wants to go for sale and they're uh, affordable at a certain rate, we would require that there be a notice of sale before it actually goes to sale. Okay. Thank you. All right, Councilmember Kochmar and then Councilmember Sepadosa. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so, Cheney, very nice, uh, good job. You did a wonderful job on your presentation. So, I just want to recap a little bit about what you said that this plan was um, paid for by a $100,000 grant from the Department of Commerce, correct? And that um, our housing costs, um, we have about 13,000 households that are cost burdened. That would be below the 30% threshold of their income. They're above. They're spending 30% of their income. I'm uh, spending more than. Mm -hmm. And um, that we've been below uh, in building units, which is understandable because we don't have a lot of open space to develop. Um, so I, I guess one thing that I noticed, uh, you said that on the um, open house you had with, in April of 2021. So, you know, since we were in lockdown, how did that work? Yeah, sure. It, it was held virtually. It was like yeah. an interactive Zoom mm -hmm. experience. Um, those that participated could uh, participate or could engage through surveys that were on the screen, um, and they, uh, you know, started with the presentation on the housing action plan and the housing strategies okay. that were developed, and then um, were kind of just an open discussion after that. So I guess I would be because a lot of people aren't on computers, don't even know how to get on Zoom. I, I guess I'd be concerned about having more of an open house now that we're open, able to have people come into the, because I'd want to have more input from our residents. Are you interested in, in some of the other um, impact or engagement uh, options we provided? Well, they were, that was all during lockdown, right? So, so yes, uh, you know, the housing, we started the housing action plan after, mm -hmm. uh, you know, COVID was declared a pandemic. Um, but there was a variety of, of ways that we intended to engage with the, with the public. So first we created a housing action plan website. It had over a thousand unique views. Mm -hmm. We've, um, I mean, yes, a lot of them were virtual, but there was also uh, phone calls mm -hmm. and emails okay. with um, a, a targeted, group, targeted like for targeted outreach in uh, yeah. groups and populations. So what we've done in the past with open houses, we've had like kiosks at the pack or uh, uh, you know, so inviting the community to come in and see the different, like your housing action plan map, uh, to have come input <coughs> that way. I mean, um, so I'd be concerned about the fact that, you know, we did a lot of it virtually and a lot of it by, I, I would be more concerned with having uh, a larger outreach to the community that that's, because I want to know what they have to say. And then second, um, how do we, how do you involve the development community? How did you involved the development community. In yeah, so uh, we had uh, market rate developers on the advisory group, uh, serving on the advisory group uh, throughout the housing action plan. Also, we uh, encourage anyone who's interested in learning about the housing action plan to be notified okay. of up upcoming meetings okay. or for future stuff through so, our interested parties list. So, so you said market rate developers. So that may or may not be the type of developer I would be interested in. I'd like to bring in a mixture of developers, not just market rate, because mm -hmm. that's tailored to a certain, in other words, pull up your housing action plan map, your housing forecast map. Sure. Thank you. Now, in looking at this map, it's hard to tell, but it looks like you've got, well, 3,000, maybe four units uh, forecast for the um, downtown core, maybe over to military and down along Pack Highway. Am I correct? 
Uh, yes. So there's a large concentration there, which then would displace any businesses that we would want to have come in there. So my concern would be, so if you, if you look at it in two ways, we have a certain number of people who live here, and they've come here because we're affordable. And, and God bless them, we want to make sure that they have a place to live. But what I'd like to do is also encourage businesses to come here so that we can have higher jobs, mm -hmm. um, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, jobs that are, uh, give them an affordable living, mm -hmm. affordable wage jobs. And then, um, but if you displace any place where I'm going to put a business, th that's going to make it more difficult to bring businesses unless we start talking about the east side. You know, if we start talking about the potential annexation area and spread out more, uh, in other words, um, where am I going to put the businesses that I want to have come here to provide the um, j wage jobs that we want? And then, and how do we attract condo ownership? Because a lot of times for our children, the first unit that they're going to buy is most likely going to be a condo. And I was told that by the Master Builders Association. So. You know, so if we do market rate, that excludes possibly condos, condo ownership. Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't, um, I guess I'm going to take it back to your uh, first comment slash question around businesses. Mm -hmm. And I think, especially in our uh, downtown and uh, these higher density areas, mm -hmm. uh, mixed use developments are, are, are mentioned in our housing action plan and also um, something that we have control over when we update the development regulations on well if, if you'd like to do apartments in downtown a certain amount of square footage or the ground floor should be a rent, uh, commercial or retail space yeah we've done that <laughs> it wasn't all that successful so um, I, and I, I know we've talked about that in the past because it was part of the discussion years ago and it, it probably is different now but that that's another discussion I think we should have but I'm thinking more, not just you know small business. I'm thinking large business. I'm thinking branching out because if we want wage, average wage jobs that, that are affordable for people to live on, we, we need to attract larger businesses. Yeah. So I, I guess I'm more concerned about referring this back to the land use committee rather than any adoption right now, just to ha have a, a bigger look at it, especially the. This, this, um, I think we had somebody on the Planning Commission that was concerned about the Homeowners Association and how um, I actually like a, um, accessible ADUs, um, detached ADUs. I actually like that idea. But I understand there are people who are concerned about that with the HOAs. So I'm wondering if we need to have further discussion on that. But that that's my input. But thank you. You gave a very good presentation. Thank you. We've got uh, Council Member um, Asefa Dawson, then Council Member Hong, and then I see uh, Council President Honda. Let me ask, before we go, Council President Honda, did you have something timely with regard to uh, what Council uh, Member Coach Mar just said? I did. I talked with Director um, Brian Davis yesterday about not voting on this tonight and having a, a public open house so that the public, now that we're open, can actually come in and see this. Mm -hmm because there's so many changes in here. I'm concerned that if we don't encourage the, the public to come in and see, they'll think that we did it right. in secret. Right. So, and I did talk to all the council members today about that, and they were all in agreement. Oh, great. OK. So. Well, it's on the agenda for that night, but thank you so much for, for bringing that up during this discussion. Uh, council Member Sepha Dawson. Sure. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much for the presentation. And I think this is timely, because we do need to understand our housing needs and how we're going to meet those needs, um, and especially around affordable housing, which you talked about. Um, and looking at the housing forecast map, and that our city uh, will, by 2040, we're going to have 6,800 new housing units. And we know that, according to HDC, King County needs, what, 244,000 um, new housing units by 2040. Um, I think this conversation is timely because we do need to make sure that we do our part also. Um, so my question is, when I'm looking at the forecast map uh, within the um, primarily mixed use or multifamily corridor, it looks like a, it cuts through the middle there. Um, I, I mean, those, especially with the 2,600 units there, or 1,300, I mean, I know they're, they're large. Um, one thing I would like to see happen as part of this is ha talking about 
having high rise, um, if that's something that we should talk about and zone and that would also address your need, uh, what you're talking about, you know, businesses and stuff, because it could be uh, land mass and capacity that we we're talking about, and I think that's what I hear you say, uh, Council Member Kochmar. And if that's the case, then I think having, um, before we weren't out of land, I think talking about that in our zoning to make sure that that's something we, we address. Um, but also, in the past, we've done um, moratoriums, and I really would like to see that avoided at any cost. So, um, like I said, this conversation is timely. As we do ha uh, talk about these, I think making sure that we do have that conversation around how we can build um, this. Um, affordable housing is very important, and I don't think it attract attracts people to any city for that reason. There's other ad reasons why people move anywhere when they do move, but this is very key and important. And so, um, I wanna work where I live. But if it's not affordable, I can't live there. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that it's it's inviting and inclusive is, is key. Um, but I think um, you guys are probably going to be talking about the um, st um, impact fee, school impact fees, or I don't know. But that also is important for us to understand because I know Federal Way has one of the highest school impact fees. And so how do we even you know balance that? Because we do want to make sure that we do have enough place uh, units for people to live and afford here in Federal Way. And so um, thank you for the presentation, but my question would be around zoning. Thank Very you. Very good. So your question about zoning in terms of like uh, achieving high rises? Yeah. Yeah, so, so there's ways that we, like so currently we have like height maximums, which doesn't necessarily ensure that the development reaches those, but other um, ways that we can achieve an intended uh, outcome for future development is through FARs, um, that is the floor area ratio, so or, or minimum height or minimum density for developments. Um, so there are opportunities that we're not currently using or activating in our code that are available, that, 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 that are out there. Um, that could be in consideration as we uh, implement strategy one in our downtown area. Yeah, and one thing I'd like to add also is um, um, the mixed population is my ideal way of going about this, mm -hmm. especially when you're building multifamily units, because one, you don't have them against us, or them and us, whatever that conversation is. But also, I think it allows everybody to live within the same area and appreciate and enjoy the same level of amenities, whatever they may look like. And so with developers, whoever we um, build those, I think ha they have to be encouraged and required to make that part of their plan. Because otherwise you're gonna have, especially as we have sound trans, and, I mean, light rail coming into our city, we wanna make sure that everybody can benefit from that being here and not make it exclusive um, and expensive for people who otherwise would be left out of those areas. So wherever we build, I think making that also our priority would be something I would like to see happen. Thank you. All right, thank you. Council Member, uh, Tran, <clears throat> Council Member Tran, and then we're gonna get over to our uh, friends at the school district. Council Member Tran. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Jenny, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is very short. Um, out of the 6,800 new housing unit that you mentioned, how many of this unit just to meet the current demand. The so the ex, there is so of twenty up to twenty twenty when we studied we identified that there was I think fifteen hundred um, there was a deficit of housing to have a, like a comfortable vacancy rate. So this sixty eight hundred units by twenty forty addresses future need and existing need. So the existing need I think it, and I'm happy to pull out that number. I believe it's like between twelve or sixteen hundred units. Okay. Okay. And then for each housing unit, what is the number that we use? How many people can be in, in one housing unit? I just try to see the projection of the growth of the city from now until 2040. Um, so it, housing units can come in many shapes and sizes. Um, there's like quite a few, I think there's like 30% of the needed housing units are for one person households, meaning like there's a, there's a great need for studio apartments or studio condos or smaller units that we don't have. So the, um, in, in the housing action plan, there's a, a distribution of the household size and uh, housing units needed. Um, so it's, it, it varies and I, I don't have those exact numbers in front of me. Um, 
but it is in the half, and I'm, I'd be happy to follow up with you on, on what those look like. Great, thank you. The other statement that I, w I would like to um, to say is that I am uh, in support of the uh, proposal from uh, Council President Honda to delay the vote so that the public can have another chance to provide their input. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, thank you. All right, and Cheney, thank you very much. Uh, we're gonna move over to uh, our Federal Way School District uh, partners, uh, Sally McLean and Ashley Murphy, who are present, the Chief Finance and Operation Officers with the Federal Way School District. Thank you, Mayor Bill. All right, just exit out of these. No, we'll oh. <laughs> I can't, okay, no, I'll just leave these here. Okay, thank you. Good Welcome. evening, Mayor Farrell, President, Council, Council President. That's a, a new term for me since the last time I was here in present. <laughs> a new name. Okay, Council President Honda and members of the Council. Uh, it is really a, a pleasure to be here this evening and, and see people in person. Um, I know I've been experiencing that recently over the last couple of weeks and it's very exciting. I am here um, on behalf of Dr. Danny Pfeiffer, uh, the district's new superintendent. I am your outgoing Chief Finance and Operations Officer. I am retiring after 21 years on August 31st. Uh, and so Ashley Murphy uh, has come to us from the North Mason School District and we're very excited to have her uh, on board here and have a little bit of time to um, work together. So the district hasn't gone crazy and hired two Chief Finance and Operations Officers. I promise you, we're just doing a little bit of overlap work right now. So again, thank you so much for this opportunity. I know your focus uh, this evening is around the Housing Action Plan. While school impact fees, multifamily school impact fees are a part of the recommendations that came out of the Housing um, Action, uh, or that are included in the Housing Action Plan, I did wanna take this opportunity to um, share a little bit of background about school impact fees. And thank you, Council Member, um, uh, Baruso for that opportunity. So I, it's uh, six slides, just so you have some sense of how much time you have to listen to me. Um, I'm, I'll share a little bit of background about school impact fees. I'll describe the school impact fee formula because this is a number that is calculated through a formula and it's calculated annually. It's calculated for single family homes and multifamily homes. Um, I'll share some information uh, around uh, some comparison school districts uh, in our area where, where Federal Way School District is part of a group of school districts called the Roadmap Region. Um, and I will share a little bit of information around the Roadmap Region in regards to their fees and their tax rate comparisons. And then again, just really want to close with a collaboration that we've had, I think, between the school district and the city over the 21 years around various different school impact fees as we go forward. So school impact fees are a one-time payment by residential developers to help mitigate or offset the impacts of new development. So it's a one-time fee assessed to residential developers. And it, it does not apply to senior housing, for example, because we don't expect any students necessarily to be living in senior housing and coming to school. Because again, school impact fees um, for schools, the impact that the school impact fees are helping mitigate is the increased need for new classrooms to serve additional scholars. So if you build new housing, single family or multifamily, you anticipate that you'll be serving new students as a result of that, and you have to have a classroom to serve them in. So those fees can't be used for hiring more teachers, even if you might need them, or purchasing laptops or textbooks or um, paying for additional school buses. They can only be used for facilities, for increasing classrooms, more classroom space. As I mentioned, school impact fees are calculated annually on an approved formula. And it's the same formula that every school district in King County uses that does um, collect school impact fees. 
It's based on something called student generation rates or the numbers of students that are coming out of the new, of the new housing. We measure student generation rates specifically to the address or what we call the grid code of that new development and measure that every year when we're submitting our new formulas. We do it for all of our single family um, developments that have occurred over the last five years and all of our multifamily developments that have uh, been implemented over the last five years. The formula includes um, the cost for additional classrooms, which may include land cost if we're acquiring or building on new land. It will include school construction costs. And um, I know as your team and you are probably all aware, we've been constructing some new schools thanks to rebuilding schools, thanks to the voters' uh, support in November of 2017. But we only include um, in our fee calculation school construction costs for new capacity only. We don't include the total cost of the replacement school. Um, so for example, our elementary schools had historically been built for about 450 students. The new schools, Mirror Lake, Lake Grove, and Wildwood have been built to, to house 600 students. So that cost is in there. Uh, we also include the cost of temporary, facility co temporary facilities, also known as portables, everybody's favorite temporary cost. But sometimes that's your choice, right? Um, it, it takes a long time to build a new school. It takes you a voter authorization to build a new school. It takes property. And so when kids are coming, oftentimes our, our best opportunity outside of changing boundaries, if we can do that, is to uh, provide temporary temporary classrooms through portables. And I yes, I am putting, I know really old fashioned to put it in air quotes, um, but we know portables really do become a permanent part of, of any school location. There are some credits applied to those costs. Those credits include any money we might be getting from the state through the school construction assistance funding program to help reduce those school construction costs. It also includes credits from our taxpayers and what our taxpayers are paying for those bonds that we're issuing to build those new schools. Then once we do all that math, <laughs> it is additionally, the um, results are discounted by 50% because there is a lot of variables in any of those formulas and the agreements were that once you figured out what the amount was, you were gonna reduce it by 50%, consider that to be the local share of what it costs for new classroom space and that we would, would um, uh, and that would be that would be your local share. Um, couple of graphs here, um, as as you heard, uh, Council President Honda mentioned, we do have um, high multifamily um, school impact fees. The orange bars represent the 2020 school impact fees. 2020 2020 school impact fees were used to assess um, uh, for new development in 2021. Uh, 2021 fees are being um, adopted by various jurisdictions between now and December. So you can see uh, the five school districts in the roadmap region outside of Tukwila um, that are more comparable in size to us are uh, Renton, Kent, Highline, and Auburn. Highline does not assess school impact fees at all. They've talked about it a couple of times, but they, um, they do not currently do that. Part of that is because they're sitting there in the port, and so they have different conversations with the port about impacting the mitigation of SeaTac. Um, Renton's multifamily in the orange bar there is a little less than 5,000. You'll notice Auburn's at the bottom actually creeped up higher than federal ways uh, in the 2020 school impact fee uh, calculations because in the city of Auburn, they began to see the same kinds of developments that we had seen earlier in this community. Um, as a reminder, we had three large multifamily complexes um, built uh, within the city. Uh, park. Uh, Park 16 was the first complex, Kitts Corner, and then Uptown Square. Um, Park 16's actually been open for six years now. So it's fallen out of the calculation for 2021. Um, what we saw that was different with this new multifamily housing is the, the number of bedrooms that were in the particular uh, units. So the, this developer did try to meet some of those housing needs by building four and five bedroom units. And so for us as a school district, what we saw was a huge spike in student, in student generation rates. We saw about 1.2 students coming out of every unit that was built. 
with more than two thirds of those students actually being brand new to the Federal Way School District, not just families that had moved um, because there was new housing available to them. Uh, we are starting to see our multifamily fee decline. Um, part of that is due to the fact that um, Park 16 is no longer in the calculation, right? So we're just looking at Kitts Corner and Uptown Square, so our family generation rates are falling. Um, but I would also point out that while we have the highest multifamily generation rates, we continue to have one of the lowest um, school impact fees for single family homes. So we have uh, in 2020 in that blue bar and in the circle, our single family fees were about 3,200. So both of those fees are again are, are hugely driven by student generation rates. Um, tax implications, again, um, when school districts have to build new schools, typically the only methodology a school district has is to go ask their taxpayers to be willing to tax themselves to do that. I mentioned our 2017 bond. There's no um, guaranteed state funding for new schools. We really have to rely on our taxpayers for funding to expand the, the size of our schools. And um, again, school impact fees do help mitigate the cost to our taxpayers. And again, using the same roadmap school districts, you, can, you probably can't see, because I didn't make that as large as I needed to, but in Renton, it costs Renton taxpayers, school district taxpayers, about three and a half cents uh, in per thousand dollars of assessed valuation to raise a million dollars in revenue uh, in uh, federal way, uh, we're at a little less than five and a half percent. I know there was some discussion about Kent school impact fees. Kent Count, Kent City Council um, does um, restrict school impact fees. Um, rather than doing a 50 percent discount, they're doing roughly a 70 and 80 percent discount. Um, but again, in Kent, the taxpayers can raise a million dollars for about three cents per thousand dollars of assessed valuation compared to our almost two times that of five and a half. So again, the, the whole concept of school impact fees is to um, require residential developers to help offset the cost of providing the additional classrooms that will be required by new students coming to school. Um, we have had opportunities to collaborate with city staff over the years. Most recently, my deep thanks to Brian Davis around uh, creating a tiered multifamily school impact fee. So even though you saw on the bar charts a flat dollar amount, uh, city council, I did believe, adopt this tiered rate, uh, which um, provided uh, discounts based on the number of bedrooms that were being built in that multifamily uh, unit. Uh, we have, I think, for the last 20 years, had the, uh, ha have supported the additional downtown core um, school impact fee discount, which uh, further, which took our impact fees and discounted them by an additional 50%. And I sincerely um, appreciate um, the invitation for the district to participate on the Housing Action Committee. Um, really appreciated Cheney's leadership, and I learned a lot. Um, always, always exciting to be involved in a conversation where I get to learn a lot. And I look forward to continued collaboration. So when we, even when we use words like single family or multifamily, the definitions of that of that housing is defined in in city code. And so when you look at that missing middle um, housing inventory, whether that's duplexes or townhomes, I think there was a third category that I'm not remembering, currently those would be classified as multifamily and subject to the multifamily fee. So just again, something for consideration as you continue to move forward and uh, wrestle with um, the housing needs and balance those with um, the needs of not just the school district, but I know the fire departments, the Lake Haven, and, and the city as you wrestle with um, growing, growing enrollment. So that is the extent of my presentation this evening. <coughs> I do have that nice little slide about do you have any questions that I can answer? All right, Council, any questions? Uh, Councilor Russo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Sally, for the presentation. Yes. Uh, thank you for your, your dedication to the school district. I'm going to miss you, so, and, and welcome. Um, a question again, when we come back to uh, assessments and things, we talk about different cities. Uh, these, the school impact fees, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, are they based on also valuation of 
the uh, houses themselves in each city? In the school impact fee calculation, there is no recognition of the um, assessed valuation, direct value of the assessed valuation. It is reflected in the concept of the credit for how much your taxpayers are paying for your bonds. So to the extent you have, a, you know, your, your bond tax rate can fluctuate from year to year, but that is a function of the amount of bond authorizations the voters have authorized and then the assessed valuation of that community at the time that we're collecting those fees or those taxes. All right. Thank you, Sally. So I wanted to make sure that was kind of straight. So a lot of that comes up when you look at the different cities, different d demographics and, and evaluations comes up all the time. So on that. So thank you. It, it is different. I think my favorite saying is, and this has stayed true for 21 years, it costs our taxpayers 10 times as much to raise a million dollars as it does for our Seattle taxpayers. So. Hmm. Council President Honda. Well, thank you for being here, and uh, thank you for 21 years of service to the district. I can't imagine you not being there. You've been there for so long. I know. <laughs> Enjoy your retirement. You, you, you deserve it, and I hope you have a wonderful time. And if I don't see you before you leave, uh, congratulations. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Maybe one more time at the Land Use and Transportation Committee. Who knows, oh, right? That's right. Awesome. <laughs> okay. That's right. All right. All right, Councilmember Moore. Well, Sally, um, I also wanted to add my uh, farewell and good luck. <laughs> I know we're talking about school impact fees, but while you're here, we just I just wanted to say thank you uh, for all that you've done uh, for our school district. I've seen you um, uh, for so many years, from uh, um, serving as an AmeriCorps member to just in the community, and I just I really appreciate you and. Uh, being here so uh, thank you for all, all that you're doing well it's been an honor to serve the federal way community over these years and I will miss it um, for sure but right. it's a good time to leave while people are still saying thank you <laughs> right uh, council member seven to, uh, yeah I have one question I'm sorry again thank you for the presentation I do echo what everyone said um, just quick question um, on your presentation you talked about the, dis the discounts for the bedroom yes. size is that um, something that you've been doing or is that a new proposal? I just, I, I'm No, that's been part of the, the, the formula that I walk through mm -hmm. um, at a really high level is a formula that was jointly developed within King County by the Master Builders Association and school districts. Um, and then, a, and a, it's, don't, I don't wanna misspeak, but that has been the standard formula that every school district uses. And that discount was, um, that 50% discount was uh, in recognition of the fact that you are using a set of data that you're projecting into the future or, or that you may be, there may be a variety of variables in any of the formula, formula. So it was an agreed upon discount um, at the time that that formula was created. So for, it means that for developers, it makes sense to not build um, four or five bedroom units then? Uh, certainly with the, the tiered, um, I, I don't know, um, with, with the tiered multifamily fee um, process that the city council adopted this last year, I don't know if that will um, create um, a better um, bottom line for residential developers if they look at developing uh, the the one or two bedrooms versus the four or five bedrooms when we had a flat fee. So again, in deference to Cheney, I believed what I heard her say was a lot of that multifamily that we were looking for was the studio or the one bedroom. So with that 62.5% discount, that may make the development pencil out. I can't speak though for the developers to know if that's okay. The only reason I'm not. Yeah, it kind of raised a red flag for me because a lot of, especially a lot of immigrant families have um, multiple children or um, and you know more than your average two per household children so it just means that it would it may discourage just developments and developers and I don't know this it's just something that came to mind to where then there's no available housing units for large families and so it's just something that tweaked well, my interest 
but we, thank you we, so much. We do think the large multifamily fee has been had a chilling effect, although I will say that right on the border of the city of Federal Way and unincorporated King County, um, the watermark apartments are the, the next round of large multifamily housing um, that are also subject to the same multifamily fees uh, if they had been built within the city. So, okay. okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Council, any other discussion on this issue? I think we there's been some discussion by the council president, council member Kochmar, that there's going to be a motion uh, when we start the uh, when we uh, address this issue at the main council meeting to push this to LUTC. Uh, council member Moore, did you have a comment? Yeah, I, I obviously would also uh, support uh, the efforts of just kind of uh, slowing this thing down a little bit and uh, seeking more public comments. So I'll look forward to adding that comment at later's uh, meeting. Um, so I'll add more details to that comment at the regular council meeting. Thank you, Mayor. All right, thank you. All right, and uh, Stephanie, do we have any public comment uh, on this item? Okay, seeing that, uh, we have- uh, Mayor? Uh, yes. I'm, I'm sorry, if I could just add one thing. With the, uh, the motion that seems to be coming, if, if we could get, if staff could get direction on what the council will be looking for uh, in terms of coming back to them, that sounded like they wanted more outreach, and I've heard a couple other things, but if we could just kind of get a sense for what we need to work on, that would be that'd be very helpful. Well, since we're in the study session now and have a, a brief time, um, I, Council President Honda or uh, Council Member uh, Kirchmar? Well, I'm thinking probably six months be, by the time it goes back to land use and they set an open house and we have people. I, Council President Honda, what do you think? I don't think we have six months, so. So uh, I guess the concern is less of the timing but more of the work. What is the work that is to be done is the question well when I spoke with you my idea was that we would have at least one open house for the public so that the public can come in and actually see this and see what's in this I don't know that we need to go through LUTC to do that I think we would just need to schedule an open house unless LUTC committee wants it back I, I don't know if you would want it back uh, council president I don't I would like for it to come out of committee Okay. So we can move it forward. So does that mean so that, it, that it will go back to LUTC? Well, I guess no. that'll be the, it'll no. be dependent upon the motion uh, that's made during the regular council meeting. So you don't need a back at committee, is that what you're saying? No, Mr. Mayor, no. Uh, okay. Well, it'll be dependent on uh, what will happen is what uh, it, what will happen is what's moved um, and approved by the council. Um, is that okay. Councilmember Kraft, do you have a question? Uh, thank you, Mayor. And um, I just want to say that I am in support of just having this to be an open house because I know I did see the survey results and oh, it was also, Chani, in your presentation for how many people were able to respond to the housing, um, you know, the different developments. I don't think that everyone is able to participate in that. And so maybe having an, an open house for public comment um, again, I don't think that we have six months, but just to hear from people now that we're open up is sort of at least where I'm at. All right. I did uh, talk with or send an email to the master builders today and said that I was going to recommend that we not vote on this tonight so that we could have some public comment, and they actually agreed with that. So. Good enough. Councilmember Kirchmar? Oh, thank you. Also, uh, thank you. I'm glad that you mentioned the master builders. I'd like to have them involved in the open house, as well as the associated general contractors, if we could send them to, uh, a formal uh, in invitation. We'll, we'll do that. And they've been with us throughout this entire process. So um, we'll, we'll definitely include them. Con we'll continue to include them. So uh, so if I kind of, kind of summarize what I heard is open house is a big um, desire of the council, which we can certainly do. And then based on whatever input we get from the public at the open house, in addition to the things that you mentioned tonight, to come back having addressed those concerns uh, back to sounds like the full council right okay yeah that's what we're hearing so do we have till did you do we have till October or how long do we have to do yeah this? we we looked into that um, we we believe that um, that there's less of a timing issue um, okay. we, we we needed an extension in order to meet the deadline to present to council um, so that it's merely that we need to bring a draft plan to the council which is what we're doing tonight so having done that we have a little more flexibility to, uh, to to adopt whatever the final form of the plan is. Okay. Um, I, I'd like to say something to Cheney because 
you did a really good job <clears throat> on this report, but you know, with the pandemic, it's so hard to reach people. And all my intent is, is that the public can actually see and know what we're doing so that if they want to comment, if they want to have a piece of this, that they can. So nothing against the report. It's, it's just that we're out of the pandemic or we're, we get to have public meetings. We're not out of the pandemic, but uh, we should involve the public now and then. So, um, all right. Councilor Kochmar. So when we have the open house, I'd like to have, I, I'm not sure how we're going to do this. I know she'll have a presentation, but I think we should talk about various things like if we have 4,000 units in the downtown core, how high are these buildings going to go? Because they're obviously apartment buildings, 10, 20, 15 stories, how high? Um, and then um, I, I think that we should also talk about a mix of development, you know, encouraging condo uh, development, uh, and then explaining the difference between townhouse, duplex, fourplex, ADUs, detached or accessor or detached or attached just so people understand what those different housing options are and the detail work is usually as the council is well aware the detail work is usually done at the committee level so my recommendation would be after the public hearing to make sure that uh, follow-up from that and feedback that was received could be um, worked through at the committee level so a more finished product could come back before the full council uh, so we could have a more reasoned discussion and not do that on the dais right. up yeah. here. So that's that's. Uh, but once again, it'll be driven by the by the will of the council during the council meeting. Uh, council Member Moore. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you for mentioning that. Actually, as a member of the LUTC, I, I, I would like to see it go back uh, to right. to the land use because I think that's a really good point well taken. Continue to vet it. Continue to ask those questions in that way. Uh, just as you stated, Mr. Mayor, when it comes here, it's the final document. Yep. Okay, all right, uh, council, uh, <clears throat> we've had the presentations, we've had council discussions and questions. I see no further lights on. Uh, executive session has been canceled and uh, therefore uh, we didn't have any public comment. We've run through our, our agenda items. In uh, 20 minutes, our regular uh, business meeting begins. At this time, I'll adjourn the special meeting. We're in uh, adjournment for the next 20 minutes, thank you.